So maybe I will start. Uh, oh, sorry. I will start a little bit from introducing our last speaker today. Uh, this is Luca Baltazar, and he's long awaited because he was already introduced a little bit by Patrick. Uh, he's a head of data science department in Gamaya, and as I understand, he created this department and this company and recruited people and built it basically so Gamaya could survive this, uh, the worst and uh, most harsh uh, first, second year of being a startup to prove uh, the concept uh, to people of hyperstructure camera that uh, they can really like, collect money and now they are a successful startup uh, with large fundings and uh, big plans for future. So um, Loka, he uh, started his career as machine learning specialist uh, quite early. He did his physics, uh, another uh, uh, master in physics in Genoa already in 2006 and already there he was working with fuzzy data sets, uh, time series and forecasting and it's really interesting because uh, right now we are mostly working on something else and we don't call it fuzzy data sets but uh, David had something like this already. Then he uh, also in Genoa he did his uh, thesis in physics and after this he moved to uh, University College London where he worked on something else on neuroimaging data and recommended system and after this we were you know, fortunate to have him on EPFL where he worked uh, for uh, three years on postdoc and he was working uh, mostly responsible for uh, computational cluster and management and uh, that's actually what was important for my department <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And after this, he was recruited uh, to work in Gamaya, where he did a really excellent job. And Gamaya is uh, going to explain much more. But one thing that I can only tell that when you look at his career, and uh, he produced a lot of papers, and usually he is choosing the topics which have some practical applications. So, for example, during this postdoc on EPFL, he patented some of his uh, discoveries and algorithms. It was a uh, EPFL, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, so something that is uh, not typically normal in research. So, welcome. Thank you. And Thank you. Hi, I'm Luca. As uh, Pavel said, head of data science at Gamaya, a company that helps farmers know their land. We provide precision agricultural solutions for more efficient and sustainable farming. So, first of all, I would like to ask to, to thank Pavel and the sponsors for organizing and supporting this event and inviting me here today. Uh, my talk will be a bit uh, more higher level than the preceding one, and uh, yeah, let's get started. So this is a, a color rendition of an hyperspectral image of an agricultural area in Brazil. Hyperspectral imaging allows to directly see materials, not just colors. For example, the army uses it to distinguish between a green bush and a tank camouflaged as a green bush. At Gamaya, we use it to understand plants and improve agriculture. In this image, then, every color represents the different properties of plants, soils, and chemicals in the water. For example, the bright green streaks here represent chemical runoff in rivers. This amounts to millions of dollars in wasted fertilizers, produces acute water and air pollution, and destroys aquatic environment. Imagine being able to transform all this information into knowledge. Knowledge that would allow the farmer to better use his chemicals, to early diagnose uh, pests and diseases, and to also accurately predict yields. This is what we're building at Gamaya, revolutionizing agriculture. But uh, we're not the only ones. There are indeed many companies that are trying to use data to unlock tremendous opportunity in agriculture. But uh, with little success so far because a true solution it's difficult to accomplish a true solution needs to make collect the sufficient and accurate data through remote sensing and hyperspectral imaging must connect different data sources via data fusion and also eventually make data relevant by using ai and crop models the roots of gamaya stem from uh, an incredible journey that blended technology science and environment we flew with ultralight airplanes from Lake Geneva to Lake Baikal across Europe and Russia, bringing 
a variety of uh, cameras, RGBI, perspectral, and so on, to monitor biodiversity and the health of ecosystems uh, in, across all these countries. It was uh, really a project of mind-blowing proportions. We collected hyperspectral imagery covering an area equivalent to one-third the size of Switzerland, amounting to more than 15 terabytes of data, which required us to invent new ways of processing and analyzing all this data. So this was a scientific project uh, carried at EPFL, but uh, we were so fascinated by what we were doing that uh, then the decision was taken to found Gamaya and start to this uh, other adventure. So we worked with aerospectral imagery. We made it uh, much smaller and simpler to use. And we quickly understood its huge potential to, as a solution to many environmental problems, especially in agriculture. Our camera is now so small that it can be flown with drones, yielding hyperspectral imagery and a resolution which is impossible to obtain with satellites. But what is hyperspectral imaging? in detail. So the camera you have in your phone is a normal RGB camera. It uh, has uh, basically three bands, red, green, and blue, that capture a wide portion of the visible electromagnetic spectrum. Then there are many manufacturers that uh, produce multispectral cameras, but this basically just add uh, one or two bands in the near infrared, which is important for monitoring plants, but there are still wide bands. Hyperspectral imaging systems usually are composed of tens, if not hundreds, of very narrow bands that are sensitive to a very tiny portion of electromagnetic spectrum. This allows to distinguish between green metal and a green bush because their responses to all these bands they will be quite different, even though they might coincide around the, the green bands. The hyperspectral data normally comes in a format as a data cube where two dimensions encode the spatial information, the latitude and longitude of each pixel's position, and the third dimension encodes the, the wavelength of the band that is measured. So if we focus on a pixel, then we get the, the spectral profile of that, picture, of that pixel. So the, the intensity of the light reflected by that area are different wavelengths. If we take this cube and we slice it al along one band, then we get the, a grayscale image that represents the intensity of the light reflected over all these areas at that given wavelength. For agriculture, we're mostly interested in monitoring crops as they evolve through time. So in practice, we are dealing with four-dimensional data cubes that are spatial, spectral, and temporal. But why does this allow to understand plants? By a very simple fact that plants are composed, at least on the surface, on the leaves, by, by different pigments, and each pigment uh, reflects light differently at different parts of the spectrum. And as the plant evolves, or enters diseases, or, or is affected by, by pressure of weeds, the relative concentration of these pigments changes. So the plant produces a different spectral response according to its status. And with hyperspectral imaging, we can detect this difference, and, uh, and then hopefully then co take the corrective actions. And this discovery spurred the scientific community to just go all around the world carrying uh, hyperspectral imaging systems to gather spectra of plants and other animals or other living organisms all across the globe. And, uh, and the challenge now is to correlate the spectra to functional properties of the plants and how they react to, to stresses, which gives rise to a new big data field that is called spectronomics. So indeed, uh, aerial hyperspectral imaging offers a unique and accurate insight into the health of plants. Like shown here, where uh, this image was taken over sugarcane fields in Brazil. With the hyperspectral imaging, we can distinguish between different sugarcane varieties and uh, also distinguish the different growing conditions. So as I, said, as I already said, this provides a wealth of information for better managing these fields and better deciding when to spray herbicides, when to add fertilizer, or when to harvest these fields. So we can truly unlock the potential of precision agriculture. Because uh, indeed, every plant is unique. The small scale farmer, like some of the farmers here in Switzerland, are able to know their plants really one by one and adapting the inputs and the processes to the specific needs of each plant. But the large scale farmer cannot do that. Some of our clients in Brazil have farms that are so big that they use airplanes to monitor them. And then they have really have to logistical problems in uh, when to harvest dedicated fields. And, um, 
So what Gamaya does with our solution tries to do is to bring this small scale contextual awareness to large scale industrial farming. We use uh, deep learning models to detect uh, every single plant in your field and tell you where the plants didn't grow. And for the plants that grew, we can tell you, for example, how far they are from the optimal time of harvesting. So we analyze the unique spectral fingerprints of each individual plant in a field containing millions. But uh, the challenge is even, is even more complex because uh, not only every plant uh, is unique, but every field is unique because every field is characterized by different soil and weather conditions, by different crop varieties, and by also by different managing, ma management processes. So adapting to this complexity is a huge computational and modeling challenge, but also a tremendous opportunity to impact an industry that impacts all of us. So what our high level view, high level view of our approach is to uh, combine data from our cameras with the other sensors, specifically satellite sensors, but also weather stations, soil measurements, uh, plant measurements of uh, plant samples, and uh, use uh, a database of spectral signature combined with uh, artificial intelligence to provide analytics to, to the farmer. Analytics that will be, that need to be immediately actionable. And at the moment we're offering them as a through a web platform the, where the farmer can see his, his farm and uh, select the fields and see the issues for each field, they receives alerts if some fields needs the, need attention. But uh, in the near future, we're planning to directly integrate with the, uh, more and more uh, field robotics and agricultural machinery. So there's a lot of uh, self-driving tractors out there. Uh, they're not really talked about as maybe Tesla and other cars, but uh, it's really a big application of self-driving uh, cars. So this is the core of uh, Gamaya artificial environmental intelligence engine, but uh, how do we build it? First of all, we need to, to pre-process the data. So uh, data that comes from our camera needs to go through several stages of pre-processing even before we can apply neural networks to produce uh, uh, meaningful analytics. And what we, our approach is to embed each of this step with machine learning. And I will give you just uh, a couple of examples of uh, pre-processing and, and then of, uh, we talk more about the analytics. So one feature of this uh, new type of hyperspectral sensors that enable to build very lightweight cameras that can be flown with drones is that uh, it's uh, a sensor very similar to the sensor in your RGB camera. But instead of having uh, just uh, three bands, R, G, B, and then green again in, your, in, in the camera, in the sensor in your camera, you have uh, much bigger mosaics, 4x4 four four or 5x5, five five, and each pixel is sensitive to a different wavelength. This mosaic then is repeated all across the sensor. So you can imagine that this is actually taking only, um, it's not sampling this whole data cube I talked about, where we have a space and then a, a wavelength. Actually, for every pixel, we only sample one, one band. So the challenge here is to go from this uh, very sparse sampling and then reconstruct the whole data cube. And at Gamaya, we have developed uh, an algorithm based on uh, total variation compressive sensing that actually s leverages the fact that uh, the images that we capture are not just uh, random images that you can produce uh, with, with a computer. They actually display quite a lot of structure. There's uh, large patches of crops, of soil, and of roads. And this type of algorithm exploits the, the fact that these structures are present to be able to fill in the gaps and so that we can obtain an accurate uh, uh, reconstruction of these data cubes. Another big challenge of this sensor, by the way they are designed, is that the, the spectral response of each band is very far from the ideal case. Here's the ideal case. Every band is sensitive to a very narrow portion and then it really drops off uh, away from that portion. The, the filters in, in these sensors actually they're a bit wider, but they also have secondary peaks elsewhere in the spectrum. So they, they're really they're not so selective as this one, they start mixing things together. So the challenge is to then demix the signal. And here it's uh, illustrated a bit better. In red, there are two bands, one which is centered here, but then has a secondary peak over here. And then another band which is centered at 610, but then has actually another big peak uh, coinciding with the, with the other band. And in blue, this would be the ideal response. So uh, having only these two bands will almost make it impossible to distinguish a signal which is centered here and a signal which is centered there. 
So what we needed to do is to collect uh, data to be able to then demix all of this by using all the bands. If you only use two, you have very little chance. But if you use all of them, there's, uh, the information is there. It just needs to be disentangled. So we built an instrument in our lab that allows us to generate uh, random spectra, a lot of uh, different spectra, and then we measure them with uh, our camera and uh, with a reference spectrometer. So in a, in a way, we're collecting we're creating a training, uh, a training set for a machine learning algorithm to map from the input, which is our raw un undemixed uh, spectra, to the clean demixed spectra. And uh, the first model that we actually, one can think about, a linear model, is actually what we're still using in production because it gives enough accuracy and it's very fast to apply. This needs to be applied to thousands of images that come out of every flight. So every flight that you see this big map is actually composed by 1,000, 2,000 images. And then we need to run this for every image and then all the subsequent pre-processing steps. We are currently exploring uh, some deep learning architecture that allow us to improve its accuracy, but uh, with the same time constraints. So this is, this is very challenging. I mean, we can really improve the accuracy with the very wide or deep networks, but then uh, the inference time is, uh, even if it's half a second, it's too much. So we need to have uh, architectures that are very fast. So now that we get the data that is uh, pre-processed, then we need to build analytics. But uh, we still have uh, many other challenges, both regarding the data and the modeling. Regarding the data is that uh, when you collect data from the air, your data, even if you do the best pre-processing steps is gonna still be affected by different light conditions, weather conditions, and uh, also different sensor generation, generations. Uh, if you want to fuse data from uh, our camera with a satellite, then you need to somehow standardize the data to a common gold standard. And this is just the input data. Then you want to correlate to how the plants are doing. So to, to know that, you need to send people on the ground. And sending people on the ground is uh, is expensive in terms of time, but also in terms of resources. And also you can only sample so much in a given amount of time. And you would need to sample, ideally you want to sample the entire field across all the growing season, because you want to monitor the crop from when you plant it until you harvest it. So it's a, it's a huge challenge to get a, a very good quality labeling. Another approach that we also uh, taking is to label the images directly. So this is the same approach that they do for autonomous driving where the, you, you get all these images and you have to label this is a person, this is a tree, this is a sidewalk, this is a road, this is a car. Uh, but also this one is, uh, is very time consuming because the, the features of the plants, if you want to label them very accurately pixel wise, uh, they're very complicated. So even with the brush, then it takes you really a huge amount of time. So we ended up developing our own labeling tools and that now after several iterations of testing, we're starting to outsource it to, to freelancers to, to scale up our, uh, our labeling. And furthermore, not a big challenge that uh, you never finished collecting data. The data keeps coming with new, with new campaigns as the plant's growing, uh, as the camera evolves, as the, the new satellites. So also the data sets are constantly evolving. And so this requires us to keep training and fine tuning and reassessing our models on a continuous basis. Here is just uh, an example of uh, a labeling task. This is uh, just a patch of an aerial image of a sugar cane. Uh, well, the colors are not, uh, not the best, but uh, basically here what we want to label, we want to say that, okay, this is a road where plants are not supposed to grow. This is our, our, our plants. And then there's soil in between plants. So there are gaps where the plants didn't, are not growing very well. Here, maybe you cannot see very well, but uh, here there's a big patch of, uh, of weeds, of grass-like weeds. So we want to really label these pixels uh, on all these classes. So what our labeler does is that other starts from uh, semi-automatic, say semi-supervised uh, segmentation based by clustering. You, we can define some seeds, say, okay, this is a, a plant, this is soil, and then try to extrapolate from that and then have a first course segmentation. What we also do is to take the the last model that we train and use it as a, as a pre-labeler, and then manually and painfully, uh, we have to go there with a the brush and really say, okay, this is actually the, the road, and uh, this is uh, in, uh, in yellow, these are, these are the weeds. So this is uh, how you, we get the data in practice. And of course, the, the resolution matters. If, uh, 
Uh, this is just the, on the limit case where at certain points you cannot really distinguish even with a human eye. Is this really a plant or is this just some soil? Uh, so in, in some cases we are required to, to fly much lower to really see every single leaf of the plant so that we can really say, okay, this is a plant that is growing normally and this is a, a plant which is uh, not growing normally. And what about the models? So there's a plethora of models out there. We, we saw some models today. Uh, ResNet, Inception, uh, SegNet, uh, do you go wide, do you go deep, do you have these skip connections? What do you do? Uh, we take a very pragmatic approach. We, we take some models that have been out there already quite a few years and have been constantly compared to because constantly they give quite a, a, good, a good performance. And then we, we implemented just a few models. At the moment we're focusing on fully convolutional networks and the segnet and we're exploring recurrent neural networks. We focus on two so that we know them very intimately. So we know how to adjust them if, if they do not perform as well. We, we choose only few because then we can optimize our implementation to reduce all data transmission bottlenecks from the CPU to the GPU. And also we can uh, really achieve almost linear scaling with the number of GPUs. This is, uh, uh, it doesn't come out of the box. You, know, you take a model and then you buy eight GPUs and then you reduce the time by eight. You need to invest quite some time to, to optimize the, the code so that uh, you have uh, a factor of eight in your uh, in your time reduction for training. And secondly, how do we maintain reproducibility of our models? And how do we quickly go, if we found a good model is performing well, then we put it in, pr in production? Because we don't want to have similar problems that we code in Python and then we have to recode everything in C++ so that uh, we, can, uh, we can use it in production. So for, for training and uh, keeping track of our training experiments, and uh, submitting also the jobs to our cluster or to the cloud, we decided to adopt this platform. It's called Etros. It's a German startup that soon will release a, a new tool called DeepKit. I really recommend to have a look. For, um, I will show a, a screenshot of it and uh, give a bit more details in the next slide. For assessment, uh, pixel-wise metrics, even though we label pixel-wise, pixel-wise metrics do not really make sense when you are interested in uh, plants. Your unit of interest is the plant. Is the plant sick or not? And you don't care about is this pixel correct or not. So we need to do, write some of our custom code so that we can do uh, assessment metrics that are as close as possible to the business uh, metrics. And then finally, if to do, go quickly move from prototyping to production, what uh, we have at Gamai is that we have a, a robust processing pipeline in, uh, in Java. And then the analytics are basically plug in via Docker containers. Docker containers allow you to wrap a code and the model in one basically closed environment that can be run uh, by, by any platform. So you don't have to take care about uh, versioning, the, the version of Keras, the version of Python uh, and the operating system. You, you can directly run the whole container and then uh, it will just run its own code inside. So this allows us to quickly go from prototyping to, uh, to production. So Atros has a, this very black, almost Gotham style. This is a screenshot of a training uh, interface where you submitted your model and then you can live track it, uh, how, much it's, how many epochs, uh, the batch size, how many images per second is uh, processing and monitor the metrics that you can define uh, in a custom way. But you can, uh, Atros is directly integrated with Git and Docker so you can maintain full reproducibility of your experiments. And also since it's fully integrated with Git and you want to compare two experiments, you say, okay, this experiment has a higher recall, but the other one has a higher precision. And you want to understand what's the difference be differences between the two, not just in terms of hyperparameters, which you can kind of quickly read in, in, in this interface or in terms of, uh, of, of, of the metrics, but you, this tool allows you directly to see the, the Git diff, so the, the difference in the code. So maybe if you change uh, hard, a hard-coded parameter you can directly see through the interface. So uh, we, we really, we're really fond of this tool. So let's go to the analytics that we developed. So we, this is our, some of the analytics we developed for sugarcane. Planting failures, it's we, I plant the plants, but some of them do not grow. I want to detect where they didn't grow and assess how, what the area covered by the, by, the, by the gaps so that the farmer can decide whether and where to replant. 
We can detect uh, weeds and identify them so the farmer can decide whether to spray the herbicides, where to spray it, and also what type of herbicides. Because depending on the weeds type, you need to choose different herbicides. Uh, with, the, with similar kind of segmentation networks, we also train one for uh, detecting soil. Uh, we're working on soil erosion, and this is uh, very important because sometimes this uh, soil erosion can become so deep that the, the equipment cannot pass anymore. So by detecting where soil erosion has occurred and how severe it is, then the farmer can take or not take an action, uh, kind of go and refill it with soil so that the farm equipment, when it goes harvesting, won't get stuck. And then finally, the holy grail we're working on, uh, it's, uh, it's yield prediction and, and show variability within the field so that the farmer can understand, okay, my field is kind of reaching my yield target, but, uh, uh, or not. And then, but there's a part of a field which is not uh, producing as much as I wanted. Do I need to put more fertilizer? Will have an effect at this point in time? So we can really help them uh, uh, take these decisions. Another crop we focus on is uh, tobacco. And uh, again, here we train uh, by painstakingly labeling some, uh, some many, many images. We train a model to detect uh, plants that are in fact infected by uh, a, a virus which is quite common for these plants and then we also analyze the, the density of infected plants so that the farmer again can see okay this is a big patch of infected plants and maybe uh, from here it can spread to, to the rest I need to address that very very quickly. Another important operation that uh, needs to be performed by tobacco grow growers is to cut off the, the flowers. The plants grow grow and then at some point they start flowering and uh, to get the best tobacco out of the leaves, they, they need to cut the flower so that uh, the growth of the plant is focused on the leaves. And to do that, they, they need to know when the plants are flowering. And the way they do it now, they just send some people on the field. These fields are quite huge, that they can be uh, two kilometers in diameter. So they're really big. So they send scouters in the field, normally just on the edges, and then they count out of 100 plants how many are flowering. But this is a very local, uh, and often it doesn't really reflect the, the status of flowering of the entire field. So we, again, developed another neural network that can detect very tiny flowers on all these plants and then count them and tell the, the farmer, okay, how many of the plants in my, in my pivot are, farm, uh, are flowering as it reached the, a critical threshold? If yes, then I go with the, my, my machine and then cut all these flowers and spray what's called sucker side so that the plant stops growing. And finally, last important step of tobacco cultivation is the harvesting and you need to harvest at exactly the right time to get the best quality. And here we have a, a four class segmentation model that classifies every visible leaf of the plant. So the plants here are these blobs. I didn't, like we could zoom more and see really kind of the, the different leaves. And uh, for each leaf, we can say whether it's uh, uh, at the right condition for, uh, for harvesting or it's the, at an early stage or it's even uh, overripe or it's too late. And, and based on this, again, the farmer can decide uh, uh, whether to wait one more week before harvesting or harvesting uh, uh, tomorrow. So I've given you just uh, a glimpse the, of the opportunities that data science, machine learning and AI uh, can bring to agriculture. And given you some hints of how we approach these problems at Gamaya with the machine learning and hyperspectral imaging and satellites and all the sensors and some of the analytics we, we're currently offering. Uh, but there is so much more to be done. And uh, humanity, as you know, is, keeps growing. Food is running out. The land to expand our farms is actually almost over. So the game now is to make them much more effective, efficient and sustainable. Thank you very much. Uh, do we get the feedback out of a correct, uh, corrective action that are taking out of our recommendation? So uh, we're working towards it. It's not uh, easy to close the loop, yeah, as you can imagine, because the data needs to go to the farmer. The farmer then, at the moment, just uses the portal to, to take the decisions and then orders his uh, employees to do certain actions. So we need a way of uh, recording these actions and then uh, if it's important, then organize another drone flight to, to see the result of the action. So it's something that we, uh, we're working on uh, on two fronts. One, to create uh, some kind of uh, apps to, to give to, to the workers so they can kind of log their work and this data can come directly to us. 
and uh, and also we we carrying um, pilots where uh, on some fields they do what we recommend and some fields they do what they are normally doing so that we can really monitor uh, the, the impact that our technology is, 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 is having both in terms of quality but also of course uh, financially. Can you detect and uh, differentiate uh, genetic modified uh, plants and non-genetic? Honest, so the question is can I detect uh, genetically modified plants from non-genetically modified plants and uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, <laughs> it's not something we, we try to do. Uh, probably if somebody comes and says this is a cool project, I'm willing to pay you this much, then we can try. But we have very, very limited resources and at the moment uh, there's a lot of these cool projects that uh, we are potentially interested in, but uh, uh, we still we we still not a company. We're still a startup, so we need to really to focus on uh, on these products and and sell them. But uh, uh, potentially, yes, if uh, if it, it changes something in in the way these pigments, the the relative proportion, or maybe what we're also doing that I didn't show you here, it's a time series analysis. So. Uh, having all these images and stack them together across time, then we can monitor how the plant is developing, not only how, how it looks at a certain stage. So OGM might have a different temporal dynamic than other plants. And this is what we notice for varieties. So you take two varieties of sugarcane, they have a different temporal dynamic. So the information might be there, it just we didn't explore it. Another question from David? Um, so it's, this is really interesting, and obviously the, the needs is, is clear. Um, so my question is, is why have you chosen tobacco as your first use case, or one of your first use cases? So it's why did we choose tobacco? Uh, we've been criticized a lot for choosing tobacco, uh, both internally. I was one of the first to say really tobacco, um, but uh, as a startup, I think you really need to take certain difficult choices. You, you, you need to somehow find a use case where you can develop your technology and find a partner that allows you to, to do this. Uh, for, uh, for sugar cane or for other mar uh, markets, the, the market are, were, were kind of fragmented, so we couldn't find this ideal partner that would allow us to really monitor the fields year around and give us the resources to scout the fields and really also knew exactly what they wanted from this technology. So with them, we could really develop uh, the processing pipeline, the scouting protocols, uh, and, uh, and really ask for feedback about our models. So this, I think, really allows us to, to get started with this technology and prove its value. And, uh, but I don't think we, we just want to be tobacco. Actually, our interest is in many other crops that have uh, quite a, a negative impact on sustainability and then we want to solve those problems and uh, as, a side, if a, as a side effect we also solve uh, sustainability problems in tobacco cultivation then I think that's also another bonus. Okay, so thank you very much for your ever hope to obtain if they even go by the plant and look at the leaves themselves? Can you obtain more with that? Or is it more like helping the models? So the question is, does hyperspectral measurements uh, help more than actual person being there? Uh, in two fr uh, the answer, my answer is yes in two aspects. One is that even if you send a person there, for certain type of measurements, you need to take a sample of the leaf and send it to a lab to be measured. For example, if you want to measure the potassium content of the plant, you cannot just send a person there and looks at the plant and tells you it's uh, 50 grams. You need to cut the plant and send the... So with hyperspectral imaging, we're developing models to uh, directly estimate this from the air. And um, well, I think that's the that's answer. Uh, the last question here. Actually, also a question more on the business side of the business model. As you said, actually, this technology can greatly help uh, farmers, uh, which is great, actually. It offers them a really very advanced analytics, very detailed. But my question is the following. Uh, if the farmer pays for you, that's good. Great price or some big agricultural firm. 
But then the big trader, you know, I think Carter and Nestle, was to get access to this kind of analytics. So actually, both parties access to this information. And actually, the, the loss of one is the gain for the other. With this kind of analytics, the big trading, we have more pressure actually on, on price for the farmers. So how would you resolve this kind of uh, access to information? So, I mean, it's not a zero-sum game necessarily. I mean, if it's a zero-sum game, only if you focus on, on predicting yield, and then the farmer can play his games of setting his price, but if a trader knows the, our same prediction, then he, kind of, he, he has also a strong hand to, 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 to play the prices down. But uh, I think most of the advantages of our technology is really to improve the efficiency of farming itself. For uh, now, there's a lot of wasted chemicals that is used because they just don't know if they need to spray this much or that much or if even the field doesn't need to be sprayed at all. And uh, as well for the weeds, if they, the, some, most of, our, of the current practices now, if they detect weeds in the field, they just spray the whole field. Uh, they don't do this localized. The machines are ready to do it, but uh, they don't have the data to feed the machines to spray locally. And also they don't have the trust yet to only spray locally. So there's also a cultural inertia that needs to be addressed. 